what we learned in the 20th century is not only that a big place, um, uh, but that uh, it's not just a big place, there's space and time, space and time are, uh, are, uh, are unified, um, and that nonetheless in this big universe there are small things, there are small fundamental particles, starting with atoms, but we understood more and more about what's smaller, and this big universe is filled with small particles, and that these particles um, interact with laws that are compatible uh, both with principles of special relativity and with quantum mechanics. So this is a summary of the of physics a la 1930, 1935. Right? Relativity and quantum mechanics in a big universe. Something which is amazing, uh, which is I think still underappreciated, and I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about it is that these two principles, given that we live in a big universe, you have to take that for granted, right? Given that the universe is big, and given relativity and quantum mechanics, that almost completely dictates what the laws of nature can look like at sufficiently large distances. There are no choices in what the world can look like. There would be zillions of choices if it was just quantum mechanics, and zillions of choices if it was just relativity. But big space-time, quantum mechanics and relativity almost completely dictates what the laws of nature can look like at sufficiently long distances. And this is the real triumph of the uh, 20th century, is that these principles, together with a large space time, make the structure of the universe almost inevitable. Now, we normally talk about this when we teach uh, quantum field theory courses by talking about the great rigidity of this uh, structure that unifies special relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, quantum field theory. But I want to talk about it just for a little, just for a little bit in a more invariant language. Um, some of you uh, perhaps are familiar with, but, but still uh, uh, completely familiar to uh, most, most people. Um, so I don't want to make any assumptions about the language with which we're going to describe nature. I'm not going to assume that fundamentally we have quantum fields, that we have right to Ron Jan Kaplan, as well as all of that. Forget about all of that. I want to take the actual observations. The actual observations is that we have particles and they interact with each other quantum mechanically compatible with relativity. Let's begin with that. And let's also begin with uh, uh, another aspect of what we learned, that the world is big, the particles are small, and if we go to very, very uh, sh uh, short distances, that means high energies. So in some approximation, we should be able to neglect the masses of the particles. So that means that we have to now think about how massless particles can consistently interact with each other. And this is where all the magic begins. Um, so we first want to talk about massless particles. Uh, very easy to group the four momentum of the massless particles into a two-by-two two matrix in a familiar way. Um, you'll notice that the, the p squared is the determinant of that matrix. So if this matrix, uh, if the uh, momentum is null, then that tells you that this two-by-two two matrix is actually has rank one. The zero determinant is the outer product of the two-dimensional vector and another two-dimensional vector. These are called spinner helicity variables. And if you're going to write down some, uh, uh, some amplitude for how these particles interact with each other, you don't care where you got it from. You know, if someone told you, this is the answer, they're just going to give you the answer, uh, they're naturally expressed as a function of these spinner helicity variables. Now, something very beautiful happens when you talk about the simplest non trivial amplitude you, we could think about at all, which is a three particle amplitude. Okay? First thing that could happen, the first non trivial thing that could happen. Uh, something that's, that's remarkable is that uh, momentum conservation of three particles forces either these lambdas to be parallel or the lambda tildes to be parallel. And that in turn tells you that the three particle amplitude is completely determined up to an overall constant just if you specify the felicities of the particles. Okay? Not once do I have to mention a Lagrangian or write something down or compute finding rules, nothing. This is just completely specified by uh, Poincare. So much for the three particle amplitude. This is already a, a remarkable fact, right? But let's see, uh, but that's equally true for particles of spin 2 and spin 17. Okay? So let's see what happens when we try to write down consistent four particle amplitudes. And now you imagine that you're computing in some approximation the theory of weak coupling. If it didn't have a weak coupling, you wouldn't have these atomic states anyway. So there's some weak coupling. In the lowest approximation, this amplitude should have only poles. And, um, uh, but it can't be a random function with only poles. Um, unitarity tells you that uh, on the poles in the S or T or U channel go to zero, this four particle amplitude has got to factorize into the product of two three particle amplitudes. Now it turns into a math problem. Um, um, that uh, uh, you can make an ansatz for the most general possible four particle amplitude. 
Now, if you demand that that thing factorizes correctly in all these limits, it, it tells you the following restriction on this function of s, d, and u. Okay? And now turn it into a math problem. Can you find a function of s, d, and u that has the following kind of singular behaviors as s, t, and u goes to zero? Script s to the spin of the particle. It's a very simple math problem. You can go off and solve it yourself, and you'll find something remarkable. It's almost never possible. There's only two solutions. One when the spin is zero, and the other when the spin is two. And not only do you determine that those are the only solutions, but you determine what the answer is. So you actually compute the four particle amplitude uh, as, as, as a bonus of this exercise. So that's very startling. You see nakedly in front of your eyes, without ever having to talk about a formalism, an underlying formalism. It's just a fact about whether you can write down consistent amplitudes or not. But if you try to write down the theory of a single spin s particle, it's impossible unless s is zero and it's phi cube theory, or s is two and it's gr. Now, what about other theories that we know and love? Well, here it's a very simple exercise, just with one particle. So for instance, what happened to yang mills theory, right? Well, so let's say, uh, uh, so uh, that's good. It's good that we don't have a consistent theory of a single spin one particle, because that wouldn't be allowed to have uh, the non abelian interaction. Um, so, but we've never heard of yang mills theory. We haven't heard of gauge symmetry. We've never heard of any of these things. We just keep on going. We say, now, what if we allow more than one kind of particle? So we allow many particles. Now, you go back and do exactly the same exercise. This coupling is what it was before times something I'm calling GFABC. FABC here means nothing other than just the label for what that coupling is. And then you discover that it's possible. It is possible, but only if the FABC satisfies the Jacobi theory. And you begin to discover the only consistent theories you're allowed to have. I'll skip that. Um, so, in fact, well, I'll say it quickly. Uh, the normal way we talk about these things in terms of gauge symmetries is an artifact of a historical way that people ran into these ideas 50, 60 years ago. Gauge symmetry is not fundamental. It is not a part of nature. It is part of our language of describing nature, but it's not a part of nature itself. It's not seen in the structure of the final answers. And in fact, today we know many, many ways of getting the final answers, which never have talked about any of uh, the usual, uh, uh, any of this usual this is a more powerful statement about the direct uh, restrictions that quantum mechanics and relativity put on the way the world works. In fact, you can just carry out this exercise in full generality, allow all kinds of particles with all possible spins, and see what survives this test that you can build a consistent four particle amplitude. And the answer is amazing. The only particles you're allowed to have have spin 0, half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. You discover you can only have one spin 2 particle. That's the graviton. Of course, it does that everything gravity does. Uh, you, uh, the spin one particle is going to look like Yang Mills. Spin a half, spin zero, all the structure that we're, that we're familiar with just comes out directly as a consequence of the consistency of relativity and quantum mechanics. You discover you're allowed to have spin three halves particles, but only if the world is supersymmetric. You discover supersymmetry. You discover all of the stuff that we have found in a more tortured way in the last 40 years are the direct solution of a very concrete little math problem derives from the physics of uh, ensuring that, uh, that, that 2 to 2 scattering can be consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics. It's remarkable that until the Higgs was discovered, of these possibilities for what nature could do, the only things that we'd seen it do were a half, one, and two. The Higgs added spin zero. That's what's so interesting about the Higgs. Okay. And the thing that's left is spin three halves. That's the reason why most of us care about supersymmetry so much. Um, might have a role in solving the hierarchy problem. That's, that's an extra fact for, motiv for motivating finding it at the LHC or at future colliders. But the deeper reason why theorists like supersymmetry so much is it's the answer to a question. What is the last thing nature can do compatible with those general principles that we have not seen it do? Okay. Supersymmetry is the last thing nature can do that we have not seen it do yet. And it's worth looking for and seeing if it's uh, uh, there. Now, the whole story of the Hayes, uh, now I'm repeating things that, that you all know, but the whole story of the Hayes